Hello. So yeah, I started a business this week, but I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to bore you with this instead. I want to talk about a bunch of things that you could do tomorrow, or the next day, or the week after, that will make your next piece of content more likely to get approved by your boss, more likely to get picked up by a journalist, or more likely to convert a customer. So I want little things that will make your content a little bit better. And that's going to make your life a lot easier, and it's going to make your job a lot faster. But that's not going to get you a pay rise. What's going to get you a pay rise, what's going to get you more money for your client, is thinking a little bit bigger. So at the moment, me and my wife are expecting our first child uh, in about three months' time. And you know, because humans take quite a while to grow, and there's a lot of effort that goes into it and a lot of money, I'm very interested in how this child is going to turn out. Dandelions make shitloads of children in the form of seeds, absolutely loads. So no dandelion, apart from being a plant, also no dandelion really cares about what happens to any individual seed. What matters to a dandelion is that every pavement, every sidewalk, every crack is full of dandelions next year, the year after. And I think we should feel the same way about content because it's not what happens with this piece of content that we're about to launch, or even the next one, or 197 of our 200 pieces of content that we're going to do over the next few years. What matters is that everyone sees our content, and everyone cares. And that long-term view is quite important. So Amara's law states that people tend to underestimate the effect of a technology in the short run, and overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect of a technology in the long run. And what that effectively means is people expect a lot right now, and people think that that's just going to go away. And in fact, great content does the exact opposite of that. Great content performs better in the long term than it does in the short term. You might get a lot of pickup, you might go viral, you might have a huge campaign, but what really matters is did you convince someone to do something that you wanted them to do? So a great example of Amara's law in action is the hype cycle that Gartner uses. So you start off with this innovation trigger. Now, the innovation trigger for content marketing was back in maybe 2012, 2013, we couldn't buy links anymore. Not that we did anyway, but let's say that we couldn't buy links anymore. And there was an innovation trigger, which was we needed to find a way to earn links, or we needed to find a way of getting links without paying for them. So suddenly, everyone has this peak of inflated expectations of content marketing, because every publication that has Search Engine in the name, and Forbes, and every big blog on the internet, and every big blog that says content marketing is the future, it's the next big thing, it's what you should be focusing all of your time on. So we get this huge expectation that inevitably doesn't get delivered on. And we fall into this trough of disillusionment, where actually we're starting to think maybe content's not the, not the thing. Maybe we should be doing little PR campaigns that get us a few links here and there that aren't quite so risky. Or maybe we should be spending more money on PPC. Or maybe we should be doing something else entirely. But as time goes on, we start to settle into a rhythm where we get good at content. We get good at doing what we want to do. And we reach this plateau of productivity where we can kind of churn out great campaign after great campaign if we know what we're doing. So let's say that. Yesterday, you were in this trough of disillusionment when it comes to content marketing, and tomorrow, you're going to be in this plateau of productivity. The way that we're going to get to that future is we're going to invent it. We're going to talk about what could we do to get there. So here are some ways to become a better paid content marketer. Let's go right back to the 1940s, 50s. Laswell's model of communication says who says what to who in what channel, with what effect. We, as content marketers, are very good at these three things. We know what we're going to say. We know what our campaign stands for. We know what it's about, what the idea is. And we know who we're going to say it to, because that might be journalists, but that might, that might be customers. And we, as SEOs, really do know a lot more about our customers than you know, we give ourselves credit for. We have more data than most 
people in the marketing departments about who our customers really are. And we know what channels we're going to use as well, because we know what channels Google can see. We know what channels are going to have an effect when it comes to our core KPI, which might be, might be links, might be traffic. So we are good at those things. And the fact that we're not good at these things is why I want to talk about them today. I want to talk about who you are, who is your brand, and how understanding that better is going to make you better at this. And what effect are we looking to have? Because the effect that we often chase as content marketers is engagement. And all engagement really means is that someone paid attention to you for a few seconds. Did they really care? So where your ideas come from should really determine what kind of content that you're creating. So let's say your desired behavior is that you just want people to buy this one thing right now. All you care about is that you're going to sell more of this product, or you're going, to sell, uh, you're going to sell a surplus of product, or you've got something that you need to shift, or you have uh, a core date, Black Friday. I'm going to talk about Black Friday a few times today. Then action advertising makes sense. PPC, direct response. I want to get this word out about this product right now in front of the right people at the right time. That's a, great, that's a great model to use. That is something that you should be doing for your content. You should be pushing display ads. You should be doing paid social, that kind of thing. Then tension. Tension in the world, tension in the environment, the internet that we live in, should influence campaigns to be more culturally relevant. And a great example of how this, you can see this in action right now, is Gillette's The Best A Man Can Be campaign. They've spotted a tension that clearly matters to their customers and crucially matters to people who aren't their customers, in one case the press, but also everyone who would potentially buy razors for their husband or whatever it might be, a core category for Gillette. So they have a cultural strategy for their advertising, which funnily enough has earned them a lot of links. Category convention, so what is every one of our competitors doing? And I know every single person in this room has had a conversation with their boss or their client that says, well, they're doing that, so we should do it too. If lots of your competitors are doing this thing, what you should probably do is the opposite. Do something completely different that no one is expecting you to do, because that's how you get cut through. And customer insights. I've mentioned already, we are very good at getting customer insights. We're good at getting data from Facebook and from Google and from all of those sources, from CRM. Classic planning makes sense. And the best model I've seen for planning, the simplest way to understand what planning really is when it comes to planning a campaign from JWT, uh, which isn't really an agency anymore, but JWT uh, has been one of the staples of advertising for a very long time. And their planning model is really simple. It's where are we? What do we have right now? What is it that we've got and what is it that we need? Do we need more links? Do we need more content on site? Do we need more social following? Do we need more brand search? Do we need, what is it that we need? Why do we need it? So clearly, we've got a goal in mind. We want to attract more customers and change the way they think about us. But why is it that we need more links? Why has everyone else got more links than us? What is it that we are missing out on? And then where could we be? I think it pays to think big. I don't think that if you are a small brand, you should be thinking what I want to be is a slightly larger than small brand. I think you should expect that you want to be a big brand. And the beautiful thing about content is everyone is pitching the same journalists and everyone is talking to the same customers on social channels. And great content can talk to those people, whether you are a tiny brand or a brand with all the money in the world. And I'm going to give you some examples of that too. How could we get there? I've mentioned content. It's about creativity. It's about thinking outside the box. And it's about thinking about those things. What do we not have? And where could we get them from? And then when we launch a campaign, we need to ask ourselves, that original goal, whatever it is that we need more of, are we getting any closer to that? Because what we may be guilty of is kind of looking at that big KPI that we've set ourselves for the year and never really moving the yardstick if we are getting any better at it. So classic planning models, something like AIDA, uh, awareness, interest, uh, decision, and advocacy, the classic marketing funnel. Google has recently rebranded that into see, think, do, and care. It's the same thing. It's the usual kind of Google uh, propaganda of micro moments and the zero moment of truth and that sort of thing. Take an established model and say why Google is good at it. However, 
it makes a lot of sense. So if we're going through see, think, do, and care, what we need to bear in mind is there are two reasons for each of these things from a customer's point of view. There's a rational reason they should see a campaign or think about your brand or your product or think that there's a, a rational reason for doing what you should do. And there is also an emotional reason for doing it. So I'm going to give you, a campaign, I'm going to give you an example of a piece of content, a really straightforward piece of content. Uh, I've spent, recently spent a fair bit of time at a car brand, and one thing that often gets asked is, what fuel type is right for me? And we're very good at answering this question rationally. Well, road tax, well, if certain types of fuel and certain types of engine pay less road tax, so that's a good reason to get a certain type of engine. The economy of a diesel is better, and the cost of a petrol engine is cheaper. So actually, if you're bothered about cost, uh, it's going to cost you more to buy a diesel car, and the range of an electric car isn't quite up to scratch just yet. So if we're answering all these questions rationally, as we often do, we compare these different types of fuel and expect customers to make up their own mind. We don't consider the emotional aspects of this. What's this doing to the environment? Maybe our customer really does care about their choice of engine and how it affects the environment. Maybe they care about the noise. And that doesn't mean they really want a quiet engine. Maybe our customer is the type of person, so Stratstone, uh, where I've been working for a little while, maybe they want a really loud engine, actually. They want everyone to know what they're driving, because they are very interested in self-image. And maybe it's a stress purchase. Maybe there's a very good reason why they suddenly need this car. Maybe you need a bigger car all of a sudden, because suddenly you're expecting or suddenly you found yourself needing to downsize a car or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of reasons, triggers, emotional responses that make you want to change your car that we don't necessarily create all that content around. So this is a piece of work that Nathan in the Pendragon uh, content team did. Uh, not real numbers in here, by the way, but it's a similar sort of thing and not telling you how long over a period of time it is. But um, Nathan did a content audit of all of the content on Evans Halshaw's blog and categorized it into see, think, do, and care. Now, you can quickly find out how each of those types of content is performing for you with Deepcrawl. You can literally just tag those blog posts with topics. So uh, in this case, this is manually done in an Excel file, but you could use WordPress and then just export all your WordPress tags. You want to crawl the site with Google Analytics integration enabled with Deepcrawl. And then you just want to use a copy and VLOOKUP that data into this chart and summarize with pivot tables. So we can see that we're very good at think campaigns at Pendragon. We make people think pretty well because we're getting more conversions and more assisted conversions per word, per piece of content than we are on any of those other channels. And maybe we need to look at more care content. And we need to look long term at that content too. So one tactic that is often a sensible idea is an editorial board. And I think the idea of content half-life is quite interesting because when you create a piece of content, you should definitely consider when does this expire? When is this piece of content going to be no longer relevant? Or when is it going to need a review? Is that going to be six months or 12 months or maybe longer? So try something like a calendar and put in your calendar when each piece of content has gone live and then a year later when the expiry of that piece of content is going to be. And then form a board of people in the organization who should care about this. So maybe it's the product team, because it's product content, as well as the editorial team or copywriters, uh, as well as marketing or other people who should care about content. And each month, you can see which pieces of content are going to expire over the course of the next 30 days. Just divide it up and say, what needs to happen? Has anything changed with this product? Has anything changed with our customer? Can we make this a little bit more interesting? You should maybe think about making it a little bit longer or shorter or however customer is interacting with the content. And this idea of tweaking over a period of time is, is, is really significant because uh, Shopify, as an example, build product, uh, Spotify, sorry, build products like this. So they have an idea. It takes a little bit of time to get an idea together, but they don't spend a lot of money getting that idea together. They just think, you know, they literally sit and try and be creative. And they think they've got an idea that makes sense, so they quickly build it and they throw some money behind that, and they get it out there. So they push it, they make sure that they get some eyeballs on it really quickly, and they spend some money doing that. But the majority of the time, is spent tweaking that content, making it more and more relevant to the people that it's being pushed out to. Because people change, 
and the environment that those people live in changes. Google's a brilliant example of this. So this is a graph from Systrix for Black Friday rankings for two websites, blackfriday.com and theblackfriday.com. The interesting thing about this graph is that Systrix does not show seasonality in search volumes. So what you might originally think when you see this graph is that suddenly there's a massive peak of search volume around Black Friday. Therefore, these sites are getting a lot more traffic. And that's not the case. What happens here is for the entirety of the year, Google understands that Black Friday is an informational query. People are looking for information about when it is, or what happened last year, and what were the good deals, and where should I be looking out for good deals this year. And then when Black Friday itself rolls around, Google knows this is now a do keyword. This is now something people are looking to buy something. So they completely change the entire set of search results for a week. And then they change them back because the intent of people is very different at that time. So if you're creating content around a seasonal event, don't just take into consideration what your competitors are doing right now and what that search result looks like. You want to go back in time with a tool like Systrix, or there's several others as well that do the same sort of thing, to take a snapshot of those search results and look at what the SERP looked like then. Because I guarantee you, if it's a big keyword in a seasonal, uh, in seasonal time, it's going to look very different. You can do a lot of things with intent. You can start to understand what the intent of certain keywords are. So here is a quick query for cars suitable for dogs. If I'm going to create a piece of content for Evans Halshaw that's which cars are suitable for dogs, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to search for that query. And I'm going to see that there is an, a knowledge box to begin with. But I'm going to take the next six, seven, 10 search results uh, that are in the query. I went for seven with this one because I went down as far as the telegraph because the first six, six results were competitors, kind of car dealerships, and the seventh one was a content site, and I thought that was interesting. So I wanted a little bit of diversity in there. You can see that the intent as far as people are concerned is this kind of cars that are suitable for dogs. The intent as far as PPC is concerned and Google Shopping and paid media, very different. Maybe this is interesting to those people, but it's not relevant to the query. We aren't changing the perception of the car that we're trying to sell. We're just trying to push a product with that particular channel of advertising at this point. So I've taken the seven top search queries sites, so the seven sites that rank for them. And I've just pulled the rankings and the search volumes for those seven from Ahrefs, just literally exported them into a CSV. And then I've combined those CSVs and I've sorted them for the traffic that they're driving, not the search volumes. I've sorted them for the traffic that they're driving to those top seven websites. Because what we find interesting about this is how the intent really differs. You can see that there's more search volume for best car for dogs than there is for best cars for dogs. But people, when they're searching for this particular query and the type of content I want to create, want to compare. They want to see 10 cars and choose one that they think is going to be right for them. They don't want in this case, what Siri says, which is, this is the one best car for a dog. This is what Google Home says, the one best car for a dog. Voice search would be a terrible answer in this particular query, because people want to see the diversity they want to choose when they are looking at this content. So if I want to rank, I want to make sure I've got the diversity, and I want to make sure that people are expecting to see SUVs in there. They're expecting to see estate cars in there. So I want to mention those. And I want to mention the emotional reasons why an SUV might be a good car if you've got a dog or not. I want to then look at how are we going to measure whether this piece of content was any good or not. And a KPI framework is a really good way of doing that. So SEO, on-site content PR, all one channel, really. We're doing one thing here. This is what our team's outputting. Um, but I've divided that into different categories, so that when I'm suggesting to my boss or my client what KPIs we should be using, then I want to make sure that they understand that when we're doing PR, the KPI is links. Because if they suggest that the KPI should be leads, I can say, OK, we can probably do some PR for leads. We can do some product placements and that sort of thing. That is not going to drive as much revenue as the leads that I would get from SEO. 
So we do SEO for leads, we do PR for links, and the reason we do PR for links is because it drives leads to SEO. So I said a second ago that when I'm suggesting KPIs, and that, that's, not, that's not necessarily right in terms of terminology, and I certainly never ask what KPIs should be. If you've ever asked your boss or your colleagues or your client what KPIs should be, there are typically two responses. The answer is always sales and revenue, when it's not necessarily the thing that you should be doing. Or you might get a really odd answer, like maybe we should get Google Plus Ones or something. Uh, they are not going to be the KPIs you should be looking for. Whenever I'm proposing a piece of content or a campaign or a content strategy, I'm recommending KPIs. I'm saying, OK, we're going to do these 10 blog articles. And based on my experience, the best KPIs in this situation are going to be these ones because I know that that's so much more likely when I've used authority behind that, that my boss and my client and my team are going to say, yeah, OK, that seems like a sensible KPI. And if I've just asked them, we'll end up never actually getting the thing done in the first place. So this is the point after four years uh, uh, standing on this stage and using Jordan Belfort GIFs uh, for comedy value, I'm going to talk about some interesting things that this man says, uh, which I don't think I've ever done before, but I think it's, I think, so Jordan Belfort is now a sales trainer. So you know the Wolf of Wall Street, right? So he doesn't look like this, sadly for him. Uh, but so he's now a sales trainer, and he wrote a book called The Way of the Wolf, which he talks about his straight line system for sales. And this is relevant if you're pitching an idea to your manager or your boss. It's also relevant if you're pitching an idea to a journalist. So the straight line system looks like this. I've made an introduction. I've introduced myself and my idea. And I want to get to this, a sale. And what's always going to happen is my manager or whoever it is that we're pitching an idea to is going to have a set of objections. There's going to be a bunch of reasons why they don't want to do this, or why they don't think we should do this, or why we can't do this. So, what I would suggest you do is, if you're going to pitch ideas to your clients in the near future, you should sit down with your team and make a huge list. What is every reason we've ever had an idea declined by a client? Write every single reason down, and then spend a little bit of time combining them into the fact that there's probably only six reasons. It all comes down to a couple of different things. And the simple fact is, if you've got a good reason why that reason is not a good reason, you're so much more likely to get to the sale. If you've got those objections ready, then you know how to get past them. So, for example, if my industry is boring, so I can't do that idea, or my industry is regulated, or B2B, or competitive, James Finlayson from Verve Search did a fantastic presentation on this at Outreach. Uh, a couple of months ago, so you can find it at the top of his slide share at the moment, or in my slide share, I think the link's in there as well. Um, he takes a really good view of these four big problems. What could you do to overcome those objections right now? Another idea from Jordan Belfort, because he has more than one good idea, if you are surprised by that. Um, is the three tens. So when I'm pitching to a journalist, or when my team's pitching to a journalist, I'm thinking about how much do they like me, how much do they like my content, and how much do they like my company. If there's a very good expectation that they don't like my company because I work for a payday loans company or something like that, what it means is that I have to make sure they really like me and they really like my content. I can't get away with content that journalists don't like for a brand that people don't like. And if I'm also a knob, not going to work. So I want to get these three things as close as possible to a 10. So the reason it makes sense to build relationships with journalists is because when you send a new campaign, they already like you a bit. They might not like you if you send them a load of terrible campaigns, but if they understand what type of content you're going to give them and who you are and what you're interested in and what your brands are that you represent, then when you send them an email, they're probably more likely to open it. And if you always send them good content, then they're probably going to like your content a little bit more. But what they're doing is they're deciding how much their audience is going to like this content. 
So um, a nice tool is Crystal, which is a Chrome extension. It's actually a platform for uh, kind of understanding personality assessments effectively. But Crystal has a free Chrome extension. You pay for it over a certain period of, of use, but you could get at least 10 free uses out of it. So Sarah Griffiths is a journalist, freelance journalist. She writes a lot for the Daily Mail. Um, and my uh, business partner, Carrie, works with her a lot. And she writes uh, a lot generally about certain topics, but also she is interested in different pictures to maybe what other journalists might be interested in. And that's just how we operate as people. Obviously, we're going to hear a lot that actually what we need to do for journalists because they're so time poor and because there is not a whole load of um, resource within the departments is we need to make sure everything's packaged up perfectly and it's ready to go and you just send it to them in the exact format that you need it to go live because they otherwise won't cover it. But that's not always the case. So according to Crystal, which analyzes LinkedIn profiles, Crystal analyzed Sarah's LinkedIn profile and says, Sarah might actually be interested in a collaborative approach. So you might package up 90% of this thing, but then make sure you ask Sarah's opinion on whether it's good or not. Now this is all publicly available data and it's not an exact science, but it would definitely give you an understanding of maybe I need to pitch this person a little bit more or a little bit less aggressively than I usually would. Because ultimately, journalists are people too. Everyone has a left brain and a right brain, and your left brain is thinking about the rational reasons why you would cover a campaign or why you would do anything. So you're working linearly. You're going from uh, data to data. You're working in sequence. You're working up details and logic. Whereas your right brain is random. It looks at the big picture. It's very interested in the whole thing. And journalists are the same. They, they take their left brains. They go through this rational process to decide whether their audience are going to get into their right brains, because that's where you're going to have an emotional impact. So a great way to deal with the left brain is checklists. Atul Gawande wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is, funnily enough, the best book about checklists that probably has ever been written. And he says, you want a checklist that has no more than nine items on it, and it should fit on one page. So if you're going to write a checklist, I'd recommend this book, and I would recommend you do write checklists. I'm going to talk very quickly about a campaign that Carrie did while we still both worked at Edit. And you can see this campaign results, et cetera, on Edit's website still. This is London Under a Microscope, which is for a small insurance brand called Stavely Head. And the brief from Stavely Head that we came up with uh, between us was, we need to increase the visibility about taxi, of taxi insurance. However, what we really want to do is make people feel a little bit differently about Stavely Head. It's a small brand. It's competing with Confused and Admiral and Go Compare and these huge brands. So we wanted a campaign that's going to have an emotional impact and make people think a little bit differently about this brand. So <laughs> Carrie got a team from the uh, University of Central London to swab the tube and find all of the bacteria. And it looks like this. If you visualize it, you can click on any of these individual bits of bacteria and see which ones are going to kill you. Now, funnily enough, people have an emotional response to what's going to kill them when they go to work in the morning. And as a result, the emotional response can trigger a real rational response from someone like uh, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who says, we really need to probably clean up some of these bugs that are going to kill you. As a result, we get a lot of coverage. As a result, the actual impact that we make, 2 million impressions, 2 million interactions with the content that we've got, probably has a better result than if we'd just done a few small campaigns and got the few links that we think we probably needed to improve the visibility of taxi insurance. So I've talked to you about creating extra content for emotions. I've talked about forming an editorial board and having more meetings. I've talked about spending time proposing KPI frameworks and creating checklists. And ultimately, a strategic process is not there to create work for you. It's helped you to create work faster. You can prioritize in lots of different ways. The Eisenhower matrix is a great way of doing this. If it's important and urgent, Black Friday is next week, do it. If it's not Black Friday for another six months, schedule it. If it's not actually, you're not an e-commerce brand, really, and you don't want to write about Black Friday, but someone wants you to, delegate that. And if it's not important, it's not urgent, just don't do it. Because ultimately, Peter Drucker, who's the father of consulting, says, plans are only good intentions unless they ultimately degenerate into hard work. And that's a very consultant way of saying, strategy is never an end. It's only ever the means to an end. If you've ever delivered a strategy and said, done, you're wrong. That's only the start. For us, though, this is the end. Thank you very much.